2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, Jesus of Nazareth rode down the descent from the Mount of Olives. As he approached the eastern gate, a palm-waving crowd cried, Hosanna, and the religious authorities demanded he silence his disciples. But he replied, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Today the stones that made up these ancient walls have been revealed by archaeology. It fulfills for our generation Jesus' statement that the stones cry out. The mysterious mountains of Edom, home to Arab Bedouin and the setting for romantic tales of archaeological adventure. When Indiana Jones ended his last crusade, he came to the treasury building at Petra. The world of archaeology, according to Hollywood, is very different than the real world. When Indiana Jones entered this building, he found a world of vast booby traps. But in the real world, archaeology is not as embellished, but it's no less exciting. The term archaeology comes from two Greek words. The word archaeos, which uh, means ancient or old, from which we get our English term archaic, and the word logos, which means the study of. In the 19th century, when archaeology was in its infancy, there were searches throughout the ancient Middle East looking for things related to the Bible. As a result, artifacts or remains from the biblical periods birthed the idea of biblical archaeology. There is definitely a very strong relationship between biblical studies and archaeological studies. In fact, uh, it's my opinion that one of the things that has driven biblical research in the last uh, 20 or 30 years uh, has been the momentous, uh, the tremendous uh, amount of archaeological data that has been uncovered that relates to biblical uh, texts. And, and I think that's an undeniable uh, uh, fact. One of the most exciting finds we have ever come across, and no doubt will enter the annals of uh, the archaeology of ancient Israel as one of the most significant epigraphic uh, finds, uh, at least in this uh, century. This monumental royal temple dedicatory inscription from Ekron. The first time we have a monumental inscription with the name of a biblical site and its rulers, most importantly, found in situ, in the place where it, to which it belonged, and in a datable destruction level. Now, you put all that together, and one word comes to mind, unique. This is quite an unusual uh, find. What it does, it simply shows us that we have excavated the correct site. With the finding of this stone, we actually have the proof that this was indeed the ancient biblical site, the Philistine site of Ekron. It's not the obligation of archaeology to support the biblical uh, story, but somehow it does. The lives of the kings of Judah are well documented in the Bible, and yet very few inscriptions have been found mentioning their actual names. One rare exception is this funeral inscription of King Uzziah. King Uzziah was an 8th century king. In the book of Isaiah, in the 6th chapter, we read, In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah the prophet said he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Uzziah was a leper, the Bible attests, and therefore he was not buried in the tomb of the kings. When this inscription was found, it was because the city of Jerusalem had expanded at the end of the Second Temple period, and there was a need to move the graves. King Uzziah's bones were taken then and put in another location, and this plaque was placed on the front of the tomb. It reads, Here were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah. Do not open. Well, I think the most important thing that we have to understand is that archaeology is our only source, only information that comes directly from the biblical period itself. I mean, the text of the Bible is of course sacred and holy for many, uh, but many scholars argue uh, about the history of the text, when it was created, how it was created, how long it took it to be edited and 
be finalized as it arrived to us. While archaeology can give us right information right away from the period when things happened. One example of this is the Assyrian monument known as the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Clearly depicted on this monument is a snapshot in stone of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser receiving tribute from foreign dignitaries. The inscription beneath the picture says that this is Jehu, king of Israel, a biblical figure performing an action unrecorded in the Bible. Archaeology deals mainly with material culture, not so much with ideas, philosophy, uh, poetry, wisdom, etc., as we have in the Bible. The Bible is very rich, a full world of thought, intellectual world. Archaeology is limited. It gives us pottery, buildings, fortifications, plans of cities, pattern of settlement, how many sites there were in each period, what was the population size. We can calculate even the population size in places like Jerusalem or in the entire area of Judah or the kingdom of Israel. We can imagine how many people lived in what type of settlements uh, they lived, what type of town plan uh, 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 there was, what kind of vessels they used in everyday life, uh, what kind of enemies they had, and what kind of e weapons uh, they used against these enemies. That means everything that is related to the material aspect of life in the Old Testament period can be described by archaeological uh, finds from this particular period. What were the houses of people like during the Jewish monarchy? We have some answer here in the city of David as we look at a house of Ahiel. Based on the archaeological remains of the house of Ahiel, it is possible to reconstruct a typical four-room house from the period of the Judean monarchy. For instance, in this Talmudic village at Katsrin, this whole room has been restored according to the archaeological record. The remains here are very similar to those in a house at the end of the late Herodian period. With this information, Entire ancient interiors can be restored, from living rooms and entries to kitchens equipped with stoves. Despite all of the work that scholars do in, in, in interpreting the Bible, uh, the only real new light that we have uh, coming into our study of the Bible is what archaeology provides. Archaeology can also clear up for us some statements in the Bible that may not be well understood. For instance, often we read in the Bible that the elders sat in the gate of the city, or that the king arose and sat in the gate of the city, and the people were presented before him. Oh, we read such a statement in the book of uh, Ruth, where Boaz comes and sits at the gate of the city. And with this excavation at Tel Dan, we now have a raised platform with stairs and a canopied pavilion where it is very obvious the king or some noble sat, perhaps with a scepter in his hand, to receive an audience to make judgment uh, here in the gate of the city. Archaeology sometimes connects the past with the present in an unexpected way. We're standing in a geniza. A geniza is a room that contains damaged or worn manuscripts of the Bible. And this particular geniza is in the synagogue at Masada. As excavators began unearthing the floor of this geniza, they came upon a very amazing find. A crumpled manuscript, 2,000 years old. And when translated, it read a portion of the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, the vision of the dry bones. Now, Israel at that particular time was just experiencing its new birth as a nation. And here was a herald from the past to the present from this ancient prophecy of Ezekiel, saying the nation was being restored. Before the advent of archaeology, we had no idea what the world of the Bible looked like. With the discovery, however, of artifacts, reliefs, and paintings, for the first time we were able to picture the world of the patriarchs. From the Egyptian tomb of Beni Hassan, we have a painting from near the time of the patriarchs, showing people from Canaan entering Egypt in a manner similar to their modern-day counterparts. Now archaeology has put these events back into their natural setting, so we understand clearly what it was like in biblical.